Thank you. Can I ask those members of the public still leaving to leave so quietly as the Parliament is still in session? The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 14031 in the name of Elaine Smith on Challenge Poverty Week. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in debate to press the request to speak, button, speak buttons now? And I call on Elaine Smith to open the debate. Ms Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer. Can I start with an opposite observation from RH Tony? What thoughtful rich people call the problem of poverty, thoughtful poor people call with equal justice the problem of riches. President officer, having met with the Poverty Alliance, I lodged uh, the motion to mark Challenge Poverty Week and I thank members for the, the big cross-party support that it secured and I also thank those who are staying today to take part in the debate and I look forward to hearing other contributions. Um, and also members may wish to call in to meet the Poverty Alliance in room TG 2021 after the debate. This year's message is challenge poverty in Scotland, I, we can. And there are three core themes. Poverty exists in Scotland and affects us all. Poverty can be solved by boosting incomes and reducing costs. And solving poverty is about ensuring that we can all participate in society. And the wide range of activities taking place in communities around Scotland should leave us in no doubt of the commitment to offer support to those who are currently caught in the poverty trap, whilst also speaking up together and taking responsibility for providing solutions. President officer, a recent report from NHS Lanarkshire highlighted that nearly one-fifth of children living in Lanarkshire are growing up in poverty. And in some parts of central region, I know that this will be much higher, and I'm sure that we will all agree that this is unacceptable. These worrying statistics are not only to be found in the old industrial areas of higher deprivation in Lanarkshire. Here in Edinburgh last year, on the doorstep of this parliament, there has been an 18% increase in the use of food banks. That was over 9,500 people with 96 tonnes of food distributed through food boxes in Edinburgh during 2017. This cannot become normalised and repeated year on year. And we also saw a report by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation this week saying that, and I quote, barriers to the labour market due to disability, ill health and childcare responsibilities remain prevalent characteristics of child poverty. John Dickey, head of Child Poverty Action Group, says, if we are serious about ending poverty in Scotland, it's vital that we build the public support needed to make real change happen. Challenge Poverty Week is a great opportunity to work together to highlight the damage that poverty wreaks and create the pressure needed for real action to end it. President officer, as this is uh, a members debate, it gives us the opportunity to put aside party political differences and to promote ideas for tackling poverty. And of course, the solutions we propose may differ. For example, Labour supports the Give Me Five campaign. I am sure, though, that nobody in this chamber wants to see children going hungry in modern Scotland. President officer, of particular concern is the fact that getting a job does not provide the security of adequate food and shelter for families that it should. Thousands of households living in poverty contain at least one adult in work. Now, it used to be, of course, that um, securing employment was one of the routes out of poverty, but it seems no longer. And of course, changes to family and child tax credits are also likely to cause more in-work poverty. In terms of barriers to the labour market uh, cited in the Joseph Rowntree Foundation report, as policymakers, we can take action to change the system of work to enable more parents to access good quality employment that suits their circumstances. Responsibility to tackle gross inequality and the poverty that underpins it must rest with all of us. Now, I commend the work being done by the many charities and organisations across Scotland, and I'm sure we're going to hear more details of that in the debate. I specifically, in my uh, motion, mentioned the event that's going to be held at the Conforti Institute in Cote Bridge, and I just have to put on the record that it's recently been renamed as Zavarian Missionaries Conforti, so we ought to get that right. Uh, this event is entitled Stories from the Edge, Church Action in Poverty. And it's going to bring together faith-inspired social activists to share stories, to critically reflect and explore existing aspects of what makes a good society. The Scottish Parliament has in the past recognised that faith organisations and communities have long been at the heart of providing support and assistance to those in need. And I would like today to reiterate our thanks for the work they do. 
But whilst we thank and commend volunteers and churches for their much needed interventions, it really isn't good enough in 21st century Scotland for those in poverty to have to depend on Victorian style Christian charity. We really must say that. And we must respond, of course, to the immediate problem, but we also need a fundamental shift in social policy to ensure the eradication of poverty and inequality. Along with many others here today, I recall the Make, History, uh, sorry, Make Poverty History marches of 2005, and I recognise the shared beliefs that we can and must change the way our society is organised. The economy we have today was designed it's the result of a set of decisions that were made about our society's priorities and resources. And just as it was designed, we can redesign it so that it works for everyone. Last month saw the publication of a report, Prosperity and Justice, by the Institute for Public Policy's Commission on Economic Justice. The report is the product of a two-year inquiry, and its publication is timely as we reflect on the 10th anniversary of the banking crisis of 2008. The report details the Commission's belief that a new moral purpose is needed to define the goals of economic policy and, offer a vision, and offers a vision of what this could be. It argues that the economy needs to deliver prosperity and justice together and it explains what is meant by these terms and how they relate to one another. Archbishop Welby of Canterbury, a member of the Commission, spoke out as the report was launched saying, prosperity depends on the security and quality of work, the balance of work and life, the quality of our relationships and not just about the amount of income we receive. It rests on the common good as well as individual well-being. Challenge Poverty Week shines a spotlight again on the willingness of communities to rally around and offer a helping hand. And I'm pleased that I've been able to work with the Poverty Alliance and the organisations involved. But this is also about the future. A future where local government can provide the public services we all need investing in our communities. A future where every family has high quality affordable housing, access to secure, well-paid work with a flexibility to suit all and the resources to feed and clothe themselves without recourse to charity, a future where the gap between the richest and the poorest in our society is no longer extreme. The question is, can we do this as a parliament, as a government, as a country? And the answer has to be, aye, we can, but only if we recognise that significant interventions are needed to properly challenge poverty. President officer, can I just finish with this? Next week, blessed Oscar Romero will be made a saint of the Roman Catholic Church. He spoke out against poverty and social injustice, assassinations and torture. In 1980, he was murdered, and I will simply end with his words. It is not God's will that some people have everything and others have nothing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Swift. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Mr. McMillan, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, I want to congratulate Elaine Smith for securing this important debate and also to thank her for hosting the drop-in session that I'll be attending uh, after this uh, member's debate. Elaine Smith and myself will uh, disagree on many things, but also know that we are very much in agreement on, the, on a range of things as well, including uh, the scourge of poverty. As we know, poverty affects too many households and people across the country and also globally. It blights lives, it diminishes hope, and it can also lead to a feeling of helplessness and can be a contributing factor in addiction. I'm saying also, if dealing with poverty was easy, it would have been done by now. H however, exacerbating the issue is something that is totally unforgivable, and I'm going to come on to that point in a moment. Ultimately, poverty is one of society's challenges you know, that we, irrespective of party affiliation, need to take seriously. Now, the motion highlights the event taking place tomorrow in, in the Conforti Institute, or the, the renamed institute that, uh, in Coat Bridge that Elaine Smith spoke about. And uh, I want to highlight uh, the event both that uh, Ronnie Cowan MP and myself are hosting tomorrow in the Greenock and Inverclyde constituency. We're hosting a Challenge Poverty event at the A's Business Centre in Greenock. We've promoted it as a money and heating advice surgery. We'll be joined by representatives from iHeat, Ideas, Financial Fitness, and also Christians Against Poverty. The first Three are local organisations who have helped and continue to help many people locally. And the event runs between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. If anyone watching this or reading the official report knows of someone locally who could be helped, please let them know. Presenting officer, I want to thank the organisations who have provided briefings for today's debate. And to some people, the figures might be just numbers on a sheet of paper. But in reality, these are people, these are people's lives that are being challenged every single day. Now, according to the Poverty Alliance briefing, and I quote, one million people living in the grip of poverty, including 230,000 children. 
65% of all children living in poverty live in working households, and 59% of all working age adults living in poverty live in working households. And according to Oxfam, and I quote, some 8% of adults experienced food insecurity in 2017, defined as being worried they would run out of food now, due to a lack of money or resources in our most deprived areas. This figure is 18%, and one in 10 people reported running out of food over a 12-month period. Mr. Officer, what kind of society thinks it's fine for people to worry about eating? And what kind of society uh, thinks it's fine for parents to worry about how they're going to feed their kids? And I've spoken before uh, about food banks in this chamber. In fact, uh, I led the, the first members debate on the issue. But the situation has got worse. Now, my office is a food bank collection point. I help the food bank, uh, and I'm in regular communication with representatives from it. And during the summer, I spent a few hours at the Greenwich you know, Clyde Food Bank, and I put out an appeal because they were running out of food. And last night uh, on Twitter, we were informed once again that they were running out of food. The Inverclyde Food Bank needs pasta sauce, cereal, tinned fish, tinned fruit, rice pudding and custard, UHT milk, diluting juice, and also coffee. Now, President Officer, this is disgusting. What makes it worse is that the policies uh, that have came from Westminster, including the rape clause and welfare reform, including the rollout of universal credit, has made this worse. Universal credit was introduced into Inverclyde in November 2016, and with a six-week leading time uh, before any payment, how does anyone seriously think this was going to be seamless? Then there has been the poverty wages some businesses have, have paid, and the continual short-term contracts, including zero-hour contracts, to name just further examples. Presenting officer, when the UK government create a new minister for food supplies to deal with the post-Brexit situation, then what comfort does this provide to those already living in poverty and also in food poverty? Absolutely none. Now, we have a heartless Tory government with, with eight years or ten years delivering austerity, saying also this cannot continue. People are already struggling. They cannot continue to live like this. Now, I'll end on this point, presenting officer. When a primary school child tells a staff in a food bank that in the past they fed that child and their family, what kind of impression will that leave on the staff, but also about the bravery of that child? Now, this is the reality of poverty in our communities, presenting officer. It's disgusting, it's abhorrent, and the sooner the Tories start considering all the communities that they represent, and not just the, the rich, then <laughs> not just the chosen few, then maybe, maybe their colleagues in Westminster might just consider the less well-off in Scotland and also elsewhere across the UK. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr McMillan. I call Alexander Stewart, to be followed by James Kelly. Mr Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to take part in today's debate and I commend and congratulate Elaine Smith for securing uh, this motion today. As we already have heard, Challenge Property Week runs from the 1st to the 7th of October and highlights the challenges and the realities of people suffering from poverty. The event has an annual event and the we already talked about the Poverty Alliance, uh, which is actively involved and have been working in this field since 1992. Growing out of an informal network of groups, individuals and activities back in the 1980s, the membership of that organisation uh, is very wide and varied. And I think that's exactly what it needs to be to ensure that we can look at uh, the issue at social inclusion and poverty that individuals are suffering. Its membership is made up of a wide range of organisations, uh, and these include grassroots uh, community groups, individuals facing poverty, voluntary organisations, statutory organisations, policy makers and academics. It also acts as a national poverty network in Scotland, working with organisations and policy makers in the UK and also Europe-wide. Two of the Challenge Poverty Week aims are to highlight the reality of poverty and challenge the stereotypes that exist about it and to demonstrate what has been done to access Scotland uh, with poverty in individuals and organisations. Shirley? Neil Finlay. Groups in his own uh, region and, uh, and speaking to groups over the last week or so, every one of them, I'm sure, has told him that the introduction of universal credit and the benefits cuts are one of the key components of the increase in poverty. Does he accept that? that every one of them tell him the same story. Does he accept that? 
Alexander Stewart. Thank you for your intervention. I acknowledge what you're saying. The individuals do feel that they are being challenged and the Westminster government has been mentioned in this parliament already today uh, and the, the rules and the occupations that they put out to individuals may well have an impact. I see that in my own parts of the constituency and I acknowledge that. To demonstrate that each organisation is there to ensure that their groups will tackle poverty and challenge the way going forward. However, to achieve the aims uh, of this uh, organisation across Scotland, we are they are organising things and events to take place to try and capture and ensure that individuals have the ability to ensure that they are actively involved. Uh, and that may be distributing information, supporting them, uh, making sure that they come and speak to politicians. And I think it's vitally important that we do, as politicians, listen to the views and the opinions that are being discussed by individuals. Also, that they focus on activities that ensure that individuals get the right and the opportunity to go out in their communities and do that. With a clear focus on their priorities, they want to highlight and they also want to deal with uh, and, and tackle poverty across Scotland. And we can all look towards what we can all do in future to create a bigger impact on everyone's lives and examine ways in which people and organisations can ensure uh, that they do have that self-confidence, that they do have that dignity and that outlook. Deputy Bragging Officer, Challenging Poverty Week shows the vision and, and it, it's there to try and end child poverty, to listen to those affected by poverty and to invest in high quality education. That's vitally important. In short, it's vital that we respect everybody's human rights and give them the dignity to ensure that they, the circumstances they find themselves in and to ensure that the vision that is there it should be highly commended. We need to address poverty by tackling inequality, supporting individuals on low incomes, supplying them with information about money and debt advice, ensuring that people facing injustices at poverty get the support they require to give them the confidence to manage their money effectively and to manage their resources so they can make responsible decisions. I commend and congratulate Elaine Smith and others for all the work they're doing in this and look forward to seeing progress moving forward. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Stewart. I call James Kelly to be followed by Alison Johnson. Mr Kelly, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I want to start by congratulating Elaine Smith on securing the debate this afternoon uh, in support of Challenge Poverty Week. It's a very, very important issue, and as others have said in the debate, it resonates throughout our constituencies and regions. You just need to look at the statistics and some of the briefings. Uh, the, re the recent Joseph Roundtree Foundation report illustrates that there are 230,000 kids living in poverty in Scotland and the Oxfam briefing uh, highlights the fact that 860,000 individuals are in poverty in Scotland. You know, that is, uh, that is a scandal for a m modern, you know, progressive country and it's something that we all have a responsibility to address. But it's not just those statistics, it's the story behind that, you know, what's, what is actually happening on the ground. And the reality is that there are uh, still too many people uh, not in work uh, or, you know, struggling, as others have said, you know, against the oppressive uh, policies per pursued by the UK government in relation to benefit changes. And in relation to that, even those in work, some are working in two and three jobs. Uh, over 400,000 people not been paid uh, a living wage. And what that then means is that they don't have enough money to live in proper housing, uh, to heat uh, and enclose their families. And their kids then grow up in a situation where they maybe aren't you know, able to have a breakfast before they go out to school in the morning. And they're not there for... Uh, best place to make the most of the, the educational opportunities before them uh, and don't, you know, don't get their, their, their best chances in life. So there's a whole story behind the poverty statistics, you know, people uh, struggling on low wages, living in poor housing, living in poor health and basically not getting the opportunity to live their lives with respect and dignity. And there's a challenge to all of us in, in fighting against that. I want to illustrate the, the work of uh, one local group uh, in 
Whitleyburn. I visited the Whitleyburn Resource Centre earlier this week as part of Challenge Poverty Week to look at the, the work of the Whitleyburn uh, hub. And I spoke to Fiona Boyle there. Uh, and there were three important strands to, to the work of that group. Uh, they've basically got an IT facility which allows people who are out of work to come to the hub and to get advice about their skills, to get advice about building their CVs, also to, to use IT facilities uh, and get training in that to access uh, what they need in terms of building CVs. It's also important laying a foundation for volunteers uh, in order to train uh, people who come to use the IT facilities up. And this hub has helped in terms of getting people uh, back into work and also raising their, their confidence and self-esteem, which can often be destroyed uh, as, a as a result of the poverty that they're living in. Uh, Stuart McMillan rightly uh, was highly critical of the UK government and a lot of the policies that are causing this poverty have been driven by the UK government. And it's right that we speak out against that and campaign against it. But there's also a responsibility for us in this parliament. We heard yesterday that the Scottish budget is going to be published on the 12th of December. And I think there's an onus on the government to look at the policies in that budget and the spending commitments on that budget to ensure that we're doing something uh, real uh, and live in order to tackle poverty. Uh, so if we're going to really tackle these stats, we need a commitment from all levels of government and all MSPs in this chamber. Thank you very much, Mr Kelly. I call Alison Johnson to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Ms Johnson, please. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, and I too congratulate Elaine Smith on giving us the opportunity to, uh, you know, to, to really try to begin to make more of a difference in this Challenge Poverty Week. And I'd like to thank all of those organisations who have provided us with briefings today. Um, uh, Elaine Smith noted in her speech that members' business shouldn't be as confrontational, perhaps, as, uh, as other debates, but I really do find it very difficult to contribute today um, without noting the context in which this debate takes place. I mean, it's clear that there is a, a very important role for employers in addressing poverty. It's clear that there's an important role for schools in addressing poverty. Um, but, you know, let's, let's look at schools. We discuss regularly in this chamber the attainment gap. Um, and quite frankly, it is simply impossible to reduce that educational attainment gap if we don't reduce the gap that is caused by poverty. Um, you know, how can you possibly do your best at school if you haven't had, you know, decent meals the night before, if your parents haven't had enough time to do your homework with you because they've been busy at their second or perhaps third job of that day? Uh, and that job isn't one that pays enough. So there is a role for all of us in this. Uh, absolutely. Elaine Smith. I thank the member very much for taking our intervention. I wonder should also recognise that um, holiday hunger is an issue and um, schemes like three, uh, Food 365 in North Lanarkshire help with that as well. Yeah. Alison um, Johnson. I, I couldn't agree more um, with the member. Holiday hunger is an issue. It's one that's began to be recognised and realised. I mean, you can only imagine how some families feel, you know, faced with a six or seven week school holiday when, when perhaps that meal at school has been the one hot meal of the day, or perhaps the only meal of the day. So, you know, th this recognition is really welcome. Um, I've been, I've always felt conflicted about the food bank issue. You know, congratulate those who donate, those who collect, those who work in these food banks. But the fact that this has become a, a, normal, a normal part of, of life in this country is... You know, I, I think it's a matter of huge concern and it's one we really need to seek to address. Nobody should have to go to a food bank. People should have enough money in their pocket to be able to go with their family and choose the food they want. And, you know, Stuart McMillan picked up on, on the emails that we do receive as parliamentarians, letting us know what food banks are running short of. And are these really the foods that we would be recommending, you know, when we look at becoming a good food nation? Um, I think all too often not they're tinned, you know, they're, they're not, we, well, we know that many families who are living in poverty and um, perhaps are living in B&Bs don't have access to food and heating. All these issues, of course, are in, interrelated. I think this parliament has done uh, much good work on this issue. 
you know, the fact that dignity and respect is going to be put at the heart of the social security system, and we're seeing some of that in action. We do need to do as much as we possibly can to boost income. So schemes like the Healthier Wealthier Children will have an impact. The fact that we're beginning to recognise that carers need more support is massively welcome. But, you know, when we look at the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities at the United Nations, you know, talking about the impact the cuts to social security and other support to disabled people is having, you know, families with a disabled parent or child are, uh, you know, they really are bearing the brunt of, of these cuts. Um, and I think when we're looking at challenging poverty, we have to recognise that these things are having a devastating impact. You know, our schools in Edinburgh and Lothian at the moment are being asked to contribute to food banks as part of their Harvest Festival events. And it's really come to this in one of the wealthiest economies on the face of the planet. Um, presiding officer, I, I know that I've run out of time, but I would like to, you know, thank Elaine Smith again for giving us the opportunity to challenge poverty this week. And just to say that as we go forward in everything that we do in this place, we should be making sure that we are doing just that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I, I call you, Ms. Beamish, due to the number of members still wishing to speak in the debate, I'm minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. And I'd invite Elaine Smith to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. So moved. The question is under Rule 8.14.3, the debate is extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we agreed? Thank you very much. I now call um, Claudia Beamish, sorry, Claudia, Claudia Beamish to be followed by Sandra White. Ms Beamish, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I, I too would like to thank Elaine Smith for bringing this grave matter to debate. This year's Challenge Poverty Week gives us an opportunity to highlight some brilliant organisations and, and which help to alleviate the scourge of poverty across Scotland. One such organisation is Healthy Valleys, based in Lanark, in my region of South Scotland. It works to promote health and well-being across the Clydesdale area. And Healthy Valleys is helping to transform communities and individuals' lives by working with them to solve problems, build resilience, empower them to find solutions which tackle and relieve the impact of poverty, particularly for children, vulnerable adults and older people. But some areas of rural Clydesdale have child poverty percentages of 46% compared to the national average, which is intolerable in itself. Healthy Valleys provides practical support and opportunities to improve people's circumstances, such as child health and wellbeing programs, parental support, and importantly, social prescriptions. It is a real challenge to engage with those who are hard to reach to participate equally in a community life. And particularly successful schemes is the by Healthy Valleys is the Community Health Cafes, which I have visited. And they are led by volunteers. And these cafes um, help reduce isolation and loneliness. And they allow people to have a cooked meal on site and take one home with them. So I congratulate Healthy Valleys on their work in my region and other organizations and groups across Scotland and wish them every success in the future. However, I cannot stand here today without saying we should not have poverty in the 21st century here in Scotland. Of course, people want to do things for themselves and their communities. And as a member of the Scottish Cooperative Party MSP group, I hear of and I support empowering cooperative models across all sectors, including energy, farming, housing and childcare. And indeed, last week, uh, in the cross-party group, uh, which my colleague James Kelly convenes, um, for, for co-ops, there was a student co-op um, organization here in Edinburgh, which is successfully bucking the trend of rip-off rents by private student landlords. However, zero-hours contracts, in-work poverty, child poverty are systemic in our society, and tax cuts for the rich and benefit cuts for the most vulnerable are a stark legacy of Tory rule, and that should not be ducked by Tories here in Scotland as well. The Resolution Foundation highlighted the largest single year increase in child poverty last year since the 1980s. This has been made even more obvious by the recent release of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation annual report. And this also highlights that the SNP are not using the powers of the Scottish Parliament effectively. It is clear that the failures of the Scottish Government to use their powers to tax the rich and to share the proceeds across local authorities and voluntary sector organisations is contributing to destroying lives. One example from yesterday, 
which is as convener of the cross-party group for carers, and Alison Johnson's highlighted the issue of carers. I heard of cuts to respite care, inability to secure funding for transition programs, and much more. And last week, at the cross-party... I'm afraid I can't, I'm in my last minute. And last week, um, the cross-party group for cooperatives about a serious challenges um, faced by them. We need a system change. A future Labour government uh, at the UK level plans to invest in transformational funds, uh, a statutory £10 living wage, and so much more. And here in Scotland, in government, we would introduce the Mary Barber Law, increase child benefit, and do so much more here with this government, with the powers that we have. We would tax those who can afford to pay more to have a more equal society in Scotland. And let me be clear, someone, just one person in poverty is one person too many. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I call Sandra White to follow by Claire Baker. Thank you very much, President Officer. Can I also thank Elaine Smith and congratulate Elaine for securing this debate. Uh, as members have already said, 21st century, Scotland, a rich nation, and here we're looking at 230,000 children living in poverty. It's unacceptable, absolutely unacceptable. I will go on to the social security part in a minute, but I have to say to Claudia Beamish, perhaps if your party, your party, had given the full powers and support, we would have the full powers of social security. So please remember that. We could have had the full powers. No, I'm sorry, I have to go on. I have to go on. I just want to say, presiding officer, uh, Challenge Poverty Week is an opportunity for everyone to raise their voice against poverty and show what is being done to tackle poverty across Scotland. And as others have said, the main aims of the week are highlighting the reality of poverty but like other members here, Stuart McMillan and, and also uh, Alison as well, and I appreciate what Elaine Smith has said about normally is consensual. Uh, I think there's absolutely no doubt, absolutely no doubt that the actions by the Tory government in Westminster are making more and more people worse off and driving them into poverty. And I think we have to give some credit to what the Scottish government is trying to do without all the powers of an independent country. And I'd just like to put forward a couple of things, can't go through all of it. We are the only part of the UK with legally binding targets to reduce child poverty, brought in by the Child Poverty Act. 12 million pounds invested in intensive employment support for parents. Increased funding for the workplace equality fund, that's something and a new minimum payment of £100 per child for the school clothing grant, which is a shame that kids have even got to get a grant for clothes. We're way back to the 50s and 60s. And then I come on to, of course, the new Social Security Agency, which will treat people, as Alison Johnson has said, with dignity and respect. And I come back to that point again. What a pity we don't have all of the powers in that agency, which we could tackle better with poverty. Now, we're talking about perhaps things that's going to be happen. Well, tomorrow in my constituency, myself and Patrick Grady, MP, are putting together and holding uh, a universal, in the eve of universal credit, we're having a roadshow on universal credit because it comes into my constituency in Partick this month and it covers some of Patrick Grady's MP's area too. And it's not just us that will be there, there'll be community groups, but there'll also be people there from CAB and DWP to hopefully give advice to people. And it's been said, even by Dave Stewart, the, the, the Conservatives, that yes, our post bag is full. And we see people every other day in our constituencies who are suffering the cuts through universal credit. And I want to go to another uh, aspect which is happening in my constituency also, and that's the Re Refugee Survival Trust. And that's, they're taking part in Challenge Poverty Week in the Kelvin Hall next week. Now, a lot of people don't, see, don't take that into account, but poverty and destitution are issues that affect every part of society, and its impact falls pretty disproportionately when it comes to refugees and asylum seekers also. It's 
pretty precarious position that they find themselves in. So I'm really pleased that the Refugee Survival Trust is holding this to give information to these people who are, are absolutely uh, becoming destitute, really sleeping in the streets as well, and impoverished as well. So, presiding officer, we must all strive to end poverty, but it's a disgrace that it's happening in Scotland in the 21st century. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. White. I call Claire Baker to be followed by Neil Finlay. Ms. Baker, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to start by congratulating Elaine Smith on securing this debate. I want to particularly focus on food security, which other members have mentioned. It is a disgrace that in recognising modern day poverty in Scotland and across the UK, food security is an almost accepted part of poverty. When food banks first opened, there was a degree of shock that people couldn't afford food, that it was immoral for, for people to have to access a charity in order to feed themselves. In 2011, when I first went to talk to a food bank, I had to go up to Dundee because there was none in Fife at that time. There are now eight in Fife, run by and supported by volunteers who are working really hard day in, day out to try and support the needs of their communities. So food banks are now an important part of our support infrastructure, but they often struggle to meet demand. Kirkcaldy Food Bank is having to spend at least £8,000 a month to supplement their donations. And research from Fife Council suggests there are at least 24,000 adults living in food insecure households in Fife, though this is thought to be an underestimation. The drivers for this are identified as changes to the welfare system, rising living costs, job insecurity and continuing low wages. The Scottish Health Survey was published last week and for the first time included a question on food insecurity. It revealed that 8% of adults experienced food insecurity in 2017. This figure rose to 21% for single parents. And in amongst concerns over food shortages, there's also the issue of the quality of food that people on low incomes are able to access. And the recent Food Foundation report highlights that the poorest fifth of families would have to spend 40% of their income, their weekly income on food if they were to meet the government's healthy living advice targets. So prior to the school summer holidays, I wrote to the local authorities in my region to ask them what they were doing to plan to address the issue of holiday hunger. Children who receive free school meals, and in some schools they also get a breakfast, don't get the support during the holidays. And we also know that parents will often not eat in the holidays so they can provide for their children. There were different responses. Clackmannanshire Council were not preparing any support, reporting that they'd previously run a pilot that had resulted in a lot of food waste, but they would explore options for next summer. The other local authorities, Stirling, Perth and Kinross and Fife, were running a variety of targeted schemes which were referral based and built around a programme of activities with meals. I recognise the efforts that are being made, but also recognise the scale of the demand. And speaking to food banks, community cafes and support organisations, I could see that they were preparing for an increase in demand. So as part of Challenge Poverty Week, I held a round table in Kirkcaldy um, on Monday with Fife Gingerbread, Homestar, Citizens Advice Bureau, Linton Lane Centre, Kirkcaldy YMCA, Glenrothes Food Bank and Kirkcaldy Food Bank, the Ord Valley Housing Association, the Poverty Alliance and Fife Council to give an opportunity to discuss the provision that was available over the summer holidays and what the demand was like, how did the organisations respond to that and what was the best way forward. So issues raised included sustainable funding, the reach of the provision, the extent of the referral system, how to avoid stigma and how to recognise hidden hunger. I want to thank everyone who came along to the discussion and also sincerely thank them for the effort in responding to a desperate need in Fife to reduce food insecurity and build resilience in our communities. But what can Parliament do to make their jobs easier? I think we need a comprehensive food bill as soon as possible that includes a right to food. This would give a statutory underpinning to efforts to tackle food insecurity. We should do all we can to raise income levels. Food insecurity is a symptom of poverty. We need to ensure the benefits system delivers a recognised minimum income standard. We need to ensure that the new income supplement with the Scottish Government is committed to is as ambitious as possible. And I will continue to argue that a top up to the child benefit is a good way to do this. And by strengthening the Scottish Welfare Fund, we can ensure that people receive the cash support that prevents them having to access emergency food provision. And finally, we must do all we can to avoid in work poverty. And while I have focused on food, poverty has many negative impacts on people's lives in our society, and we must all redouble our efforts to end it.
Thank you. I'll call Neil Finlay to be followed by Michelle Ballantyne, and Ms Ballantyne will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Finlay. Uh, thanks, President Officer, and I thank Elaine Smith for bringing the debate forward. Um, people have mentioned a million people who cannot afford the basics to live a decent life. Uh, if that doesn't get you angry and emotional, then I think you must have a heart of stone. Uh, across Scotland, we see the educational attainment gap growing, a mental health crisis unfold before our eyes with people desperate for help but unable to get it. I recently spoke to a group of young carers. Out of 15 of them, 13 of them had sought help for a mental health problem. We see a thousand people a year die from the effect of drugs. Food bank use, as people have said, is rising, not falling. We have a housing crisis. The people can't afford a deposit. They've been ripped off by exploitative landlords and councils not even remotely able to meet housing demand. And all of these issues affect women, the low paid, the poor, the weak, disabled and the vulnerable most. And we've had report after report after report on this issue over the years. This week, um, we all come here and we stick our badges on and we go and get a photo taken and we take part in a debate and we all feel very good that we've contributed something. We might do events in our constituency and nothing much changes. In fact, poverty is increasing. And shamefully, shamefully, and I don't think this has got anywhere near the coverage it, deserved. it deserves. Last week, life expectancy in this country is falling for the first time in many years. That is an utter disgrace. It's an abject failure of public policy. Now, we know that Tory benefit cuts the stagnation of wages, precarious work, public spending cuts, attacks on local services, all leave communities and families struggling and isolated and without enough money to pay bills, buy food and clothes, pay the rent, uh, never mind buy luxuries like toys or a books or a short break for children. And we know that when you have a Tory government, poverty increases just as much as night follows day. There was no mention of food banks or disability cuts or suicide rates increasing in Theresa May's speech yesterday or indeed from Mr Stewart today. You know, don't give us compassion today about the extent of poverty in Scotland while cheering the very people who are causing that yesterday in that speech. But if we want to do something different here, then we need a concerted cross-government response, making the eradication of health and wealth inequality, the core objective of government policy. I believe, and I always have done, that responsibility and accountability for this should lie in Scotland with the First Minister and at UK level with the Prime Minister, with every other minister and every other department contributing to an overall plan to eradicate those inequalities. And where the government does have powers, it must use them and it must act. So in Scotland, we could, we could make work pay through a living wage of at least £10 an hour in all contracts that the Scottish Government give out. We've got the power to do it. We need to end the cuts to council services, which disproportionately impact on those groups I mentioned earlier. This could happen with the political will. We have the power. We need to invest in childcare and policies like North Lanarkshire's uh, school meals policy. Again, we have the power. We need to increase the money going into people's pockets, the pockets of the most needy. We could do that by, for example, topping up child benefit. And I, benefit. And I fail to understand the First Minister's logic when she argues for universal provision in relation to tuition fees, the baby box, bus passes, all of which I support, by the way, and then argues against universal provision for putting extra money in people's pockets. It is just complete and utter inconsistency. I mean, we need to ensure that no one in our country sleeps rough or has no food to provide for their family. We have the power. We could do it with a political will. And I think we need to end the failing war on drugs and declare a national public health crisis. Again, we have the power. And if education really is the government's priority, then the approach is failing as the gap between the rich and poor is growing, not narrowing. We need to reverse this and we have the power. So in conclusion, President Officer, these debates come and go, and in many areas, things are getting worse instead of better. If the government were to act in the areas I've identified and other people have, then they would have our full support. 
because tackling uh, poverty and inequality should be the overriding priority of any government, in my opinion. Thank you, Mr. Finlay. I call Michelle Ballantyne and then the closing speech for the government. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm actually grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate marking Challenge Poverty Week. And I do thank Elaine Smith for bringing this motion to, for, for the members' debate. Um, I'm sure there have been many interesting contributions and uh, maybe I might be glad I didn't hear some of them. But I, I do apologise for my absence because uh, actually I was hosting a delegation of alpacas outside and I hope when we finish some of you will actually be able to go and see them as well. Um, uh, but just I did... before, before you go on, uh, Ms Ballantyne, I should advise that the presiding officer gave permission yes. to Ms Ballantyne. It was the presiding officer's decision. Ms yeah. Ballantyne. Thank you. And I, I was just about to say, um, and I was very grateful that the presiding officer did actually give me permission to be late because I did want to come and, and participate. Look, while we may disagree on many things, the one thing we do all agree on is that it is shameful that a million Scots living, are living in poverty. And despite some of the commentary today, and obviously there's a lot of accusation that it's all the fault of people who sit over this side, um, it actually isn't a situation that has arisen from just the actions of a single government, but rather administrations of all colours are responsible to one degree or another. And however, and I would say this to everybody um, from all sides and all colours, here in Scotland we have been handed a golden opportunity to tackle poverty and end the destructive cycle that has blighted our country for so long. The new Child Poverty Act sets out an ambitious target of reducing child poverty to only 10% of children by 2030. Of course, to advance this, the way we measure poverty would also have to change, because if you take it as it is as a medium, we're always going to have people by that measure in poverty. So I hope that this chamber, when it goes forward, will give consideration to the new indicator of poverty that was recently published by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, where it looks at income and expenditure and looks at that impact that actually has, because that's what's really important, is, is how that is measured and what families actually have to live on and what surplus they've got to bring opportunity into their lives. The Social Security Scotland Act is now enshrined in Scots law. Yep. Stuart McMillan. I thank Michelle Ballantyne for taking the intervention. Uh, but would Michelle Ballantyne agree with me that uh, with, the, uh, with the welfare reform and with some of our constituents getting less money as a consequence of that, it then means they've got less money to actually live on, for unfortunately putting more people, our constituents, into poverty? Michelle Ballantyne. Yeah, I'm not going to dispute that. Um, there is no doubt that there have been winners and losers uh, um, across the welfare reform. And I think that's something that everybody's monitoring at the moment and everybody's looking at where the impacts are, whether those are right, whether they're wrong, and what needs to be adjusted to actually do it. And it would be utterly wrong to say that the UK government isn't looking at that too, because they are. They are monitoring it, and you can already see that they've been making changes and adjustments. This is a, a radical change to the way welfare is delivered. Um, and we have to make sure that it is being altered and adjusted and, and made fit for purpose so that, that all people can look at it and whilst they might not always agree with the decisions, that they can say it was fair. Um, and we now in Scotland have a real part in that. Um, as I say, with the, with the social, new Social Security Scotland Act enshrined in Scots law um, and the dev devolution of 11 benefits... Uh, and now we've seen, obviously, Social Security is, is now open, and I was really pleased to have been and visited on Monday, and I'm going back again to talk to them again. Um, and I think we have to remember that, that both the, the Poverty Act and the Social Security gained unanimous support across this chamber. And it, that's a clear sign that when it comes to poverty, there is a will within these four walls to come together and take decisive action. However, passing legislation is just the beginning. Solving something as complex and deep-rooted as poverty cannot be eliminated by just passing the laws, or indeed by focusing only on social security. And that's why I welcome today's motion. Um, it recognises that the key to lifting people out of economic hardship is by boosting their income and ensuring their participation in society, by providing them with a range of choices and options to build a better life. Now, I've stood in this chamber and made this point before, but, but I do feel it deserves to be repeated, and I know some other members, since I've come back in, have also done this. You know, we must take a wider, joined-up approach when it comes to poverty. 
And when this chamber debated the Child Poverty Bill, I made the point then that education and under attainment has been identified as a key contributory driver of child poverty. It restricts the life chances of our young people and prevents them actually breaking the cycle as they go on to be parents themselves. Um, now, I take Alison Johnson's point that actually it is extremely difficult to, to be effective in the classroom as a child if you haven't got a full stomach. And, and those are sort of things that we can address and there are ways to do it that sit with out, outside of social security as well. And I see him having the pen, pen waved at me, so I'm gonna lose a bit of my speech. Um, but I, I just wanted to say that one of the things, very quickly if you'll allow me um, some, some leeway, that actually one of the things myself, and I, I've spent most of my life working with people in poverty, that's what my professional background is, and I feel really strongly about it, there isn't enough communication between services. The third sector do a phenomenal job you know, the public sector try their hardest to do a phenomenal job, but the communication between everybody and the joining up of how we approach things from government right the way down to the front line isn't that great at times. And there you must conclude. You've had that. six minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. You. Uh, I know... I have a feeling this isn't a point of order. If it isn't, I'm cutting you off. You can cut me off if you like. My understanding is, if you're not in time for the summing up of a debate and any other I, one... That isn't a point of order. I well, said at the beginning, no, we please can, sit down, Miss White. Do, please, Miss, White this, Miss White, don't argue with me. Please sit down. The presiding officer had given advance permission to Miss Valentine to not be in here for the start. It's the presiding officer's ruling and that you must just have to accept. I now take... Eileen Campbell, please, would you sum up, please, on behalf of the Government Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, like others this afternoon, I also thank Eileen Smith for bringing this member's debate forward during Challenge Poverty Week, a chance for Parliament to collectively assert and raise our voices against poverty in Scotland. And in her words, put aside some of the party politics with a focus instead of putting forward ideas. Uh, and that should, though, not necessarily come without the, ch the appropriate challenge to, to government and people uh, in power. Uh, but the space that has been created today has provided members with an opportunity to consider what more needs to be done to uh, challenge poverty. And to uh, Elaine Smith, I'm appreciative for her uh, providing that space. And I commend the, the work that she mentioned that is going to be happening in Coat Bridge and the storytelling, because uh, I think it's people's stories and those individual stories that are powerful and illustrate the horrifying impact of poverty in Scotland. And this week, there are also do have been a, a number of key poverty publications publishing, published during this Poverty Week, including the Scottish Government's annual report on UK government welfare reforms and the Poverty in Scotland 28 teen report published by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, launched uh, also at the Storytelling Centre, again, ensuring that people's experiences and their stories are at the forefront of the consideration about what we need to do to challenge uh, poverty. But both those reports highlighted the ongoing UK government austerity uh, and the devastating impact it will be leading to more families falling into poverty, both those in, in, in and out of work, and is forecast to increase child poverty in Scotland. £3.7 billion reduced from the benefit income of people in Scotland by 2021. And those welfare reforms have explicitly focused on reducing benefit generosity towards families with children. And this is affecting the priority families identified in the Scottish Government's Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan. For example, over the first year of implementation of the two-child limit, around 3,800 larger families in Scotland saw their incomes reduced by up to £2,780 simply for having more than two children. And this situation is only set to worsen year on year. The reform estimated to uh, bring about the biggest reduction in spending in Scotland, around £370 million by 2020-21, is the benefit freeze. And the Scottish Government has taken action to mitigate the impact of UK government welfare reform policies, including spending an expected £125 million this year alone. Uh, but unless the UK Government reverses the reductions made in social security spending, it will be even more challenging for the Government to meet the ambitious targets in the Child Poverty Scotland Act. And we'll be challenging that poverty with one hand tied behind our back. Yep. Michelle Valentine. Sorry. Um, agreeing that there has been a cut in actual spend in the, in the budget, does the Minister accept there's been an increase in the percentage point of the amount or within the whole envelope of government spending in terms of benefits. So it's gone up from 34 to 35% of overall government spend. 
And does the, does the minister feel that actually when she talks about mitigation and actually not doing it, that this, this to some degree is about choices about where you spend money on education or health? Please, or it's a short things. intervention, not another mm. speech. Cabinet Secretary, just a wee minute. Okay. I know you're desperate mm. to reply. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Sorry, Presiding Officer. I'm talking about the mitigation we're having to spend to cope with and cover up and sweep up and clear up the mess that's been left by the UK Government. And unless the Tories accept that, then to be quite frank, it's probably not worth the contributions that you make in this chamber unless you're going to adequately challenge poverty with and amongst your own party colleagues and at Westminster Government and perhaps better suited to having meetings with alpacas than thinking about contributing to this debate. Now, this report, however, also, these reports this week also, however, outline the importance of continued concerted Scottish Government action in this area and need to maintain a strong focus on child poverty across all policy areas. And that's exactly what we're doing. In developing the Chaplain Child Poverty Delivery Plan, ministers recognised that it wasn't the responsibility of just one Cabinet Secretary to deliver on child poverty. And the delivery plan took a, a cross-government approach. And ministerial colleagues have been looking at opportunities this week and beyond to raise awareness of the reality of poverty in Scotland, to highlight again what is needing to be done and what is being done to tackle this and encourage debate and discussion about how to identify more solutions. And our delivery plan is already making progress and having an impact on a number of areas. We have agreed a new national minimum level of £100 for school clothing grants, which started this academic year, benefiting around 120,000 families this year. Choices that we are making in the here and now to mitigate and help families cope with their poverty. Social Security uh, Scotland made its first payments of the carers' allowance su supplement in September, putting an extra £442 in carers' pockets. And last month, Fear for You was the first lender to borrow from the £2.5 million affordable credit fund. And the Scottish Government has also invested £1 million in this fund alongside Carnegie and the Joseph Rowntree Foundation to increase choices for people on low incomes and provide genuine alternatives to high-cost credit providers. Neil Finlay. For, uh, taking that intervention. I wonder if she could answer a very direct question. Why is it that the baby box, bus pass and tuition fees help people out of poverty, but a £5 a week increase in child benefit wouldn't? We heard Cabinet yourself, Secretary. Sorry, uh, President Off, we heard during the First Minister's questions that what we are wanting to do with the money and resource that we have is to direct and target that in the best and the most appropriate way to lift more children out of poverty. And actually the analysis that we have done of the Give Me Five campaign, while it's absolutely appropriate that they take forward that campaign and raise rightly the impact that it may have, actually it won't raise as many children from poverty as the in income supplement that we're taking forward work on in the here and now to deliver more for children across the country. Mr Finlay. So how is it that then those other policies that I've mentioned do help? Can you tell us how they help, but this wouldn't? Cabinet Secretary. In a whole host of uh, policies and initiatives and things that we're doing in the here and now to help families cope with the poverty with the, that has been inflicted on them through welfare reforms and the money that has been taken out from their pockets. And all of these things contribute to ensuring the well-being of our country. And actually, I think it's quite an important point to recognise that we want to target and direct our funding to impact the most families, the most children across the country. That's the most appropriate way in which we use and target our funds and to continue to do what we are doing, but continue to do it with one hand behind our back. And again, I think it is probably appropriate to reiterate Sandra White's point. You know, if we want us to really radically transform the society that we live in, then perhaps it's about thinking about what powers do we need here and now to actually impact and transform lives and bring people out of poverty. And again, unless the Labour Party want to uh, think about that, then we're, we're going to get stuck in a, in a crisis of not being able to do things and take forward policies without having to mitigate the impact of decisions taken elsewhere. Can I make a bit of progress, if that's OK? Um, and we're also, um, again, you know, we're taking forward other things which are around impact and targeting people who need help most. So the Best Start Pregnancy and Baby Grant, which we're working towards making before Christmas, is now six months. It's going to be delivered six months earlier than planned. And we're going to be providing parent payments to low-income families with £600 on the birth of their first child and £300 on the birth of any subsequent child. And further payments of £250 for each child will be introduced by summer 2019 at key transition points in their life. 
Again, we're also taking forward work to make, maintain a focus on poverty and work across all of government, and we've implemented the Fairer Scotland duty. And that asks all public bodies actively to consider how they can reduce inequalities of outcomes caused by disadvantage when making their uh, decisions. And members made comments on other particular issues. And I completely agree with Al uh, Alison Johnson, Stuart McMillan and Claire Baker about the unacceptability that in a country as prosperous as Scotland that people are struggling to put food on their table. Everyone has a right to food and people shouldn't be forced to turn to food banks for that. And that's why, again, the programme for government we announced is increasing funding for our Fair Food Fund to provide a dignified response to food insecurity. £2 million of this, £3.5 million funding will focus on supporting for families during the school uh, holidays. Um, and we know that, again, we need radical action in order for us to achieve the ambitious targets that we've set out in the Child Poverty Act. And that's why we have set out our intention to develop a new income supplement which will provide additional financial support for uh, people who are living in poverty, ensuring it tops up the income sufficiently to lift those households out of poverty. And while I can list that suite of actions and policies and strategies to make an impact towards eradicating poverty, there is much more we can and need to do, and we must do if we want to shift the curve in child poverty. And that means ensuring every member of the government recognises their role. That tackling poverty doesn't just mean work by me or uh, Shirley Ann Somerville, but we work across uh, transport, the economy, work and employment, are maximising the imp impact of the policies in those areas. That while we work to tackle the social injustice of poverty with a hand tied behind our back, that we continue to exert our influence and take action that we need whilst continuing to mitigate the worst impacts of welfare reform. And while I did hear uh, Alexander Stewart acknowledge the appropriate and pertinent intervention from Neil Finlay, the uncomfortable truth for the Conservative is that acknowledgement uh, won't stop the trauma, the lack of food and the lack of dignity people in Scotland face as a result of welfare reforms. Acknowledgement of that problem won't put food on people's table. And that's why Challenge Poverty Week is important and will continue to be so until we solve this. And that means stopping in-work poverty where folk work hard and yet cannot get out of the bit. Removing the barriers facing people with disability to enter the workplace and reversing the gender pay gap and being ambitious in our plans to introduce an income supplement. So by preventing poverty, we end the horrifying impact of it felt across our communities. And I don't think anybody in government or anyone across the parliament will be content by just sticking on a badge or getting a pick or a selfie done to uh, mark this week. The position that I have in this government is a privilege and with that comes opportunity. And I have uh, to say that with this week and with this opportunity, that we have a chance as a government, as a parliament to come together and understand that every week, every day, every week and every year until we see the change we need happen across the country, that that will have to drive our effort and our work. And as Elaine Smith, reimagining and, re re and creating that good society where everyone has their fair chance to flourish. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate and I suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30.